you know, you, you were recently on the Keith Olbermann show, and I watched it with great interest. Uh, you were alongside Michael Moore, and in the book, you describe how you actually, you, you were, number one, uh, very upfront about how worried a lot of the companies like Cigna and other insurers were about the movie Sicko coming out. And you actually talk about going to Sacramento, I believe it was, and sitting in the back and taking notes during a screening of Sicko. And internally, you were conflicted. I mean, you, you thought that the movie actually represented pretty accurately a lot of what was wrong with the health insurance system. Uh, you've, you've now, uh, on, with Keith Olbermann, you apologized to Michael Moore. When you now look back at the sicko incident, you also describe in the book going to a free care clinic, and I believe it was Tennessee, where people were literally put in animal stalls, and only about a third of the people that showed up were even able to get care. When you look back now, is there a specific point that you say pushed you over the edge? All those contributed, uh, certainly. And uh, I think there was, there was one other incident that probably pushed me over the edge that you might not even have gotten to in the book yet. It's, uh, it involved a 17-year-old girl in California uh, whose doctors said needed to have a liver transplant. She uh, had had leukemia. Uh, it was in remission for some time. But it came back. And um, Cigna would not approve coverage for the liver transplant. Uh, and her doctors immediately uh, submitted a renewed request and, and with additional documentation uh, and told Cigna that from and their experience, uh, Nataline Sarkeesian, uh, the 17-year-old girl's name, uh, that she would have a 65% chance of living five years if she had the transplant. Uh, Cigna's corporate uh, uh, medical director disagreed and uh, refused to, to provide coverage for it. Uh, the family didn't have the financial means to pay for it out of their own pocket. And um, so consequently, uh, she was, you know, days and days went by. Uh, while the, the, the family was appealing that decision, they were able to uh, bring a lot of uh, uh, public pressure on Cigna. They were savvy enough to get the media involved in paying attention to this case. Uh, eventually, Cigna, because of the public pressure, decided to uh, uh, pay for the coverage, but it was too late. So they announced it. They communicated that to the family. The family was uh, just joyous to, to, to finally get that news, but it came too late, and Nataline died just hours after the family got the news that Cigna had changed its mind. Uh, and, and I was the person on the front lines handling the calls from reporters. Media all over the world, actually, uh, were picking up on this story. And uh, mm. I just, uh, I'd handle what we call high-profile cases in the past involving um, uh, Sigma members or Humana members that uh, uh, had gone to the media for one reason or another. Uh, this was just one that I, I, I said, I can't do this anymore. And uh, we, within you know, a few weeks, I had uh, turned in my resignation. When you turned in that resignation, how upfront were you about the reasons why? I mean, what did you tell your bosses? You know, I was trying to process all of this. The, uh, uh, that, uh, that health expedition that I saw in Tennessee, actually it's across the state line in, in, uh, in, in southwestern Virginia, uh, all these were contributing factors. Um, I, I, at that point, didn't know what I wanted to do next. I just knew I didn't want to keep doing that. And I, uh, I remember telling them that I had had a good long run at Cigna, and, and I was very honest that the company had treated me very well. I just didn't want to do this anymore. I needed to do something else. Uh, you know, I, and they knew that I uh, I thought differently from other executives. I mean, that was that was apparent. One of the things that I've been asked before is, why didn't you do more to work from within to change uh, the way your companies operated? But again, you have the reality of Wall Street, and these companies have uh, um, uh, their business plans based on what they need to do to meet Wall Street's expectations. You can't really change that uh, from the inside. So when you, obviously, eventually it became very clear that, that you were, I, I don't necessarily want to use the term whistleblower, but it is used about you conventionally. What was the first instance where you really went public with your distaste for what was being done, specifically at Cigna, uh, kind of the, the point of, of no return in a sense, right? It was the point of no return, and I'll never forget the day. It was June the 24th in 2009. Uh, I had just reached the point that I felt that I couldn't just stay on the sidelines anymore. It, uh, it was actually more than a year after I left Cigna before I started speaking out. But th I started seeing the PR, came, PR campaign begin to kick in for the industry. I could tell it was kicking in because I'd been a part of, of helping to plan it. And uh, I just couldn't, in good conscience, 
stay on the sidelines and, and, and just watch it unfold and, and unfold in a way that I thought would be detrimental to um, the American public. Uh, so I made some, I started making some phone calls, and eventually it led to me led me to some folks who had connections with uh, Senator Rockefeller, uh, who uh, chairs the Senate Commerce Science and Technology Committee, and he was planning to hold a hearing on health insurance practices. And uh, uh, his staff, when they heard about me, invited me to come for an interview, and that led me to be invited to testify before uh, before that committee during that hearing. And I knew walking in to that uh, hearing room that uh, uh, by the time my testimony was over, my life was going to be changed forever. Do you know if Cigna knew before you actually showed up that day that you were going to be doing that? They didn't know what I was going to say, but they uh, uh, they learned at least 24 hours before because uh, the committee sends out a notice uh, of who's going to be testifying and, and what the topic of the hearing is going to be. Uh, so they undoubtedly saw my name on, the, on the, the witness list, I guess you'd say. And did Cigna reach out to you to try to find out what are you going to say or trying to, to try to tell you what not to say? They didn't. And I think they, uh, uh, they knew that that would not have been an appropriate thing to do and that if they had, uh, chances are I would have said something about it. Um, what, the way they have handled me, if you will, is to more or less pretend I don't exist mm. and uh, hope that the media will eventually lose interest in me and that I will not have a platform anymore and that uh, they can outlast me. And, and there's, a, there's a pretty good chance that may happen. The, the companies have been around for quite a long time. But uh, uh, they're, And I think I would have, have, have offered them the same PR advice if I were there and somebody else was doing what I'm doing. Uh, just kind of ride this out. Uh, uh, he'll uh, eventually the media will grow tired of him, and uh, um, and and uh, he'll just go away. You you talk, and in the last few minutes we have left, I, there's a few other points and interesting topics you you get to in the book, and one is is of national health care, and it kind of is spread throughout the book. Your comments about it, and there's an interesting story you tell that in in uh, prior to World War One. As many countries were creating kind of national health care, universal health care systems, there was actually a push in the United States to go in that direction. And that with the start of World War I, because Germany had a system like that in place, it was uh, almost an opportunity to create a propaganda campaign and say, national health care, whatever it, the, the wording was at the time, that's a lot like what Germany has. And Germany's not friends with us, right? So was that... If that had not happened, could things really have gone completely differently with national health care? It really could have. And if you read that chapter of the history of efforts to reform our health care system, it's just a... Um uh, just almost every decade, it seems, or every few decades, there was there were opportunities that we we almost we almost had it, but then something happened, like the the start of World War One or World War Two or something like that, that just uh, dashed the hopes of, of reform advocates. I think it could have, uh, but then over the course of, of years, uh, our system began to take hold as it eventually became and is today, um, became more profit oriented. Uh, and and uh, special interests more entrenched in their system. It made it even more difficult as time went by to try to reform it. Uh, you also talk about seeing some of the talking points you helped develop repeated on television. Uh, you talk about, I think at the very beginning of the book, sometimes you feel that you may have contributed to the deaths of, of, of thousands, I believe you actually say. Um, do you feel, uh, what, I mean, Talk about that a little bit. How wh are you at peace in in a sense with what you did? Uh, how do you view it all? You know, you can't go back and change the past. Right. There, I've had some uh, people who've who've been critical of me for uh, having done what I what I did, and uh, you know, I, I can't I can't undo that. And to a certain extent, I can't regret it either, because if I didn't have, if I didn't do what I did, if I hadn't had the career I had, then I wouldn't know what I know, and I wouldn't have been an insider who could speak out. I'm doing something that no one else has really done, uh, and um, I've, I'm hoping that I've been able to make a difference just by helping to educate people really what goes on behind the scenes in a way that only a former insider can do. Uh, yeah, I, 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 you know, I certainly regret that anyone has lost. Uh, a loved one or uh, 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 or, or one's own life uh, because of the practices of the health insurance industry that, that I help perpetuate. Uh, I can't change that. I regret it. And, and to a certain extent, I, I see what I'm doing as making amends. Do you uh, do you worry about your your do you think you're personally in danger because of some of the speaking out that you're doing naming names in many cases? Do you think there's a risk of, of, of retaliation? Oh, I do. Uh, before I 
gave my Senate testimony, that was the thing that that uh, concerned me most. That I would be was really putting my life on the line here, and, and, and I was going to be in danger. Uh, it might have been somewhat paranoia, and it's also just we're, we're all motivated by fear, and we're, we're fearing change of any kind, but something that dramatic, um, we really are afraid of, of taking that final step. Uh, but, yeah, these, these are, we're talking about big money here, uh, and these corporations play uh, hardball, and they play to, to win, and, uh, and I knew that, and I knew, I knew what they have done in the past to win. So I was, I was concerned. Do you find yourself looking over your shoulder today? And I've come to terms with that. I, I'm doing what I'm doing, and I, I can't. Uh, uh, I, if, if I think about that all the time, I would just be um, a mess. Sure. <laughs> I don't do that. Um, hey, last question. What do you do for health insurance now? You know, uh, I am married, and I have a wife who works, and uh, uh, knock on some wood here, uh, she uh, still has benefits, and I'm, I'm her dependent. Mm-hmm. Uh, so... Uh, uh, we, you know, we have this employer-based system, which is really bizarre in the world. Uh, but uh, as long as she keeps a job, then I have benefits, and uh, I hope uh, that you know we'll live long enough uh, to be able to to get our insurance through the exchanges that this legislation will create, and that the this employer-based system will eventually uh, uh, go the way of the dinosaur. All right. The book is Deadly Spin. The author is Wendell Potter. Thanks so much for joining us today. Real pleasure. Thank you, David. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks. All right. We are done.